going to get started. Um, so we are very happy to have Dr. Arun Agarwal here from University who waves at everyone from the <laughs> University of Michigan School That's of Natural me. Resources and Environment. But those who are older here, and I know at least one person in this room, he what he did used to be a professor here for a very brief period of time in political science. So we have made him return to his roots. Um, and this is part of the Geography Department's Anderson Annual Lecture Series, which we are very happy to have. And we tend to bring in, obviously, the bigger names, such as National Academy members, but also people that are much more interdisciplinary, but really are broadly kind of attractive and engaged across a campus, as opposed to someone that is just strictly within a discipline. So a room definitely kind of matches that one. He and I overlap from graduate school via Lynn Ostrom and the SciPec Institute in IFRI, which he's still part of. So we are absolutely delighted to have him. For those of you who also are interested in coming tomorrow, a room will also be giving a second talk tomorrow um, in which he will use more than two slides, I've heard. Who <laughs> um, knows? Maybe not. Um, but we're, we're really, really happy to have him here. And for many of you, I know a number of you are on his schedule. Um, and so for this two-day visit at the University of Florida, where Arun can pretend to be a Gator again. So thank you very much, Arun. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I have lots of different things to say before I begin to actually say anything. One of which is that I'm really glad, Jane, that you conveyed the impression I'm much younger than I am because you suggested you and I overlapped in graduate school. But in fact, I was, I think, a postdoc or something like that at that time. So Jane is comfortably and very much so much younger than me. Don't let her, don't let my looks fool you. Uh, I also want to say how wonderful it is to be back in Florida after uh, enduring something like after enduring something like uh, can you hear me still? What what is it? Twenty five degree temperatures for the last three and a half months in Michigan. So it's amazing to see the sun out, to not see any snow on the ground even to spend a little time on the beach, experience some salt in the air. We get, in the winter, we get salt and sand, and sometimes sun in Michigan. We just don't get the right temperature. Uh, something happened here. Okay. So what I'm going to do uh, is to talk today about something that is not, well, it's interdisciplinary, but it's still kind of more, insider conversation about coupled natural human systems. And before I start, and this thought only struck me about 10 minutes ago, that I realized that not everyone in the room or in the audience would know what is a coupled natural human system. So let me ask, how many people have heard of or can kind of judge what a coupled natural human system is? Oh, a fair number, but also a fair number did not raise your hand. Thank you. So I very quickly, uh, how should I say, stole a couple of slides from the internet to tell you what a couple of natural human system is in five minutes before going to talking about the role of institutions in thinking about the coupling between natural and human systems. So a couple of natural human systems are essentially what a lot of uh, people would argue, everything that we think of as natural and everything that we think of as social or human. So there is an inescapable and unavoidable connection between everything that we think of as a natural system and everything that we think of as a social system. There's a program at the NSF which provides relatively large grants to those who work on couple natural human systems and this fact has led to an explosion of research on coupled natural human systems. As we all know, you can never make academics do anything they don't want to do unless you give them grants. So if you give them grants, then people will begin to do and begin to become the thing that the grant is about. And so I used to be a political scientist and now I'm a coupled natural human systems scholar. The basic idea in coupled systems research is that what happens in a natural system or in a human system has the potential to and almost always affects 
the other system with which it is connected. So there is a process of coupling so that you think about any natural system and how it works and it has effects that come on to or that, effect, that impact human systems. And so this, ah. Yeah. So this is a particular <laughs> rendering of what a coupled natural human system looks like. And we took, I took it from one of our proposals to the NSF, which is, which is examining land transactions and land tenure change in Ethiopia and what the effects of this are, both on natural systems and on, and on human systems. So essentially what has have been going on over the last, I would say roughly decade and a half, maybe two decades, is enormous amounts of investment in agricultural lands by those who have money or those who have capital. And this movement of capital, often from rich countries, at many other times from cities, into rural areas leads to a whole range of effects that are interconnected and that influence each other. So at the center of this uh, graph, or the center of this graphic is Ethiopia, and in a large part of Ethiopia, roughly about 2% of the country's land surface, investments by international investors and by domestic investors are turning ongoing agricultural processes into new forms. What is going on? So there are a number of different things that could be going on, and that is what we seek to investigate in this proposal. One possibility is that as international and domestic investors put new money into land and acquire control over this land, this process could lead to disaffection and unrest, because what happens, most land is not free, there are people living on it, but if you're investing millions of dollars into a given area of land, you want that land to conduct agriculture because agricultural prices, commodity prices are going up. If you want that to happen effectively, you want to throw the people out, throw people who are thrown off their land. They suffer food and energy insecurity, and as a result of that food and energy insecurity, they become uh, antagonistic to these transactions and to the government which is supporting this transaction which leads to social dissatisfaction and then as you have more investment this cycle picks up steam and you see considerable violence and social instability in many parts of Ethiopia. So this is what you would call one set of potential effects of land transactions and investments in land by international investors. But there's a second possibility, which is that instead of throwing people off the land in which an investor has put money, they could involve the people who are living around this land into different kinds of art grower schemes, depending on the kind of crops they're cultivating. And as a result of being engaged in art grower schemes, you have increased incomes for the local populations. This increased income increases their food and energy, insecu uh, energy security, and that leads to them supporting this process of investments and uh, uh, in engagement in our grower schemes. But this is only the social side of what investments do. On the other side are a whole range of effects on ecological or environmental processes. We said we'd look at just one of them if you have increased crop production as a result of investment because most of these investments are for higher levels of intensification and commodification of land and increased production of commodity crops. This increased specialization and focus on specific crops would lead to reductions in biodiversity and reduction in uh, ecosystem services. However, and as this continues to happen, because the effects of these are not felt immediately, the government continues to invest in land or in, uh, continues to invite investments in land and these continue to lead to these negative effects on, one, on the one hand in terms of environmental outcomes, but positive effects on the other hand in terms of increased crop production. And the other part of this whole system or this whole representation of the system is to connect how what is happening in the human system affects the natural system and the other way around, okay? So I, I 
I presented, I presented this uh, graphic not because I want to go deep into the research that we are doing in Ethiopia, but as one instantiation, as one sort of elaboration of how human and natural systems are coupled in our understandings of and in our representations of coupled natural human systems research. And what I want to do for most of this talk is to talk about how coupled natural human systems are coupled and what role a particular uh, uh, institution, a, a particular form plays in this coupling, which is institutions. So I'm going to disconnect this because we no longer want this. And I'm going to go to my written remarks. And I will mostly talk from here, from now on. Until you ask me questions, in, in which case I'll come outside again. Rhonda said to me, you must come outside and walk around, which is why I did all that walking earlier. <laughs> she also said, you have an instrument, and if somebody is not paying attention, point it at them, and I will not do that. OK, so the rest of my talk, as I said, is going to be about uh, the role of institutions in coupled natural human systems and how institutions promote the coupling between the social, or within the social systems and between social and environmental or ecological systems. And this builds on a lot of my research, which focuses primarily on institutions and governance. And based on my own work, uh, which I described just now, but also a whole range of additional studies of coupled natural human systems, I want to focus on how CNH, coupled natural human systems researchers, conceptualize and operationalize institutions in their studies. I'm doing so because institutions are what are called boundary objects in this work. So how many of you already know this idea of boundary objects? Boundary objects. So boundary objects is a science and technology studies term which essentially describes any entity or any object that enables uh, uh, friction or enables connection between two what might be very different uh, uh, spheres of work or different spheres of research or different sp spheres of policy. Essentially, one could think of universities as boundary objects. One could think of research think tanks as boundary objects. One could think of as policy advisors or consultants as boundary objects. Essentially, any entity or any object that enables conversations to occur between two groups of people or two areas or two areas of work that don't normally talk to each other. And I think of institutions as boundary objects because in CNH research, they enable conversations between those who work on ecological systems, those who work on environmental processes, and don't, those who don't necessarily care very much in their disciplinary settings about social objects, about social work, social, not social work, social analyses, and those who care mostly about social analyses and not so much about ecological work or ecological research. So institutions serve as a connector between ecologists and social scientists, and hence they are boundary objects in CNH research. But I'm going to present a very preliminary ideas about how conversations across CNH research teams may be possible and what others interested in this coupling between natural and human systems can draw from these kind of conversations. As Jane said, today I have only two slides. It's not a paper that is fully developed. Tomorrow I'll be presenting something that is much more developed. But today it's mostly a conversation, and I'm inviting you to a conversation in terms of thinking about how institutions can, one, be better represented in the roles that they play in this research, and two, whether it is possible to do so, and perhaps it is not, and I want to leave that possibility open. So institutions are necessary in general models of coupled human and natural systems that include representations of purposive human action. So we like to think that most of the things that we do are purposive. They are oriented towards a goal, and that's why we do them, because we want to achieve that goal. And that's, stan that's the standard way in which human actions are represented or conceptualized in CNH models. And institutions are important when CNH research tries to identify the mechanisms that drive outcomes or that lead to outcomes in coupled systems and seeks to avoid undesirable outcomes in these systems and to promote more desirable, socially desirable outcomes. And the general point I want to make in this work is that CNH research, a couple human systems, natural human systems research, tends both to overestimate the flexibility of what institutions can accomplish 
So the ways in which they can bring about change in coupled natural human systems and the degree of stability that institutions impart or confer on coupled systems in enabling them to function in a, a more or less stable uh, manner. This overestimation of, the both, of both of the stability and of the flexibility, and I will talk about why I say this, both of the flexibility and of the stability in turn leads to erroneous assumptions about the extent to which coupled systems can change through purposive actions or remain stable through purposive actions. Institutions appear in coupled systems research in two ways. One, through the specific forms in which they are represented, and two, in terms of the role that they play. So if you think about form and role, those are the two ideas around which a lot of what I'm going to say next is organized. And second, in terms of the role they play or are expected to play in the way the elements of this coupled natural human system interact with each other and the different coupled processes unfold over time. In terms of form, the threefold hierarchical description of institutions as proposed by Eleanor and Vincent Ostrom is a useful heuristic to understand institutional representations in coupled systems research. These three, uh, this threefold uh, institutional representation is at the operational, at the management, and at the constitutional level in Ostrom's work. Uh, institutions as individual rules and norms. So collectively, institutions are often defined as, you know, you say, what is an institution? And people will say, institutions are the collections of rules and norms that guide behavior and expectations. So at the, but that is only at the operational level. Institutions, institutional rules and norms structure everyday decision making and choices of agents or decision makers or individuals in any given system. At this operational level, institutions are important because they help us describe how agents interact with each other and with natural resources and with the system as a whole. Thus, in the famous flocking example where you show how birds flock together, the rules for attraction towards other agents, maintaining distance from other agents, and moving towards the critical mass of other agents are all operational rules. This level of interaction between human behavior as structured by operational rules and natural processes is central to description of coupled systems and their basic behavior. Many of the features of coupled complex systems such as emergence, feedback, nonlinearity, path dependence can all be described by and ascribed to the way operational rules work to structure human everyday behaviors and interactions with each other and with the system. At the management level, institutions are rules for selecting operational strategies for everyday interactions. Such management institutions and rules for monitoring, for exclusion, for sanctions, for adjudication are all central to an assessment of the system's performance. Such management rules can stem from users themselves or be given by higher level authorities who prescribe how or prescribe policies or who create new governance arrangements. So these institutions structure, once you have operational rules, whether they will be followed, how they will be followed, what will happen if people don't follow them, and if there are disputes over them, how those disputes will be resolved. They are tied to adaptation and self-organization in coupled complex systems. Higher level constitutional rules influence management regimes which are embodied in the policies and governance arrangements, and they come into play to understand the longer term behavior and changes in the performance of any coupled system. They are also tied to the concept of self-organization, but in addition to the ideas of state transitions and equilibrium changes in coupled systems. So these are the three different levels at which institutions are incorporated in coupled systems to show and to explain how coupling happens and what are the results of the coupling because of agent behavior, okay? So operational management and constitutional rules are the forms in which institutions appear in CNH research, and the second way in which they appear is in terms of the role they play, what functions they carry out or en enable. Rules and ins institutions remain a fundamental element in structuring the coupled system insofar as they structure human expectations, their intentions, their actions, their interactions, and their inputs into natural systems. 
They work to structure both behavior and the information that you have. They are regulators of what you do, or what people do in these models. Most CNH models incorporate human decisions and actions as part of the representation of the human system and of human actions in the development of the model. In these cases, either CNH models assume institutions in defining what's the range of human behaviors and actions, or they explicitly highlight the role of institutions in structuring expectations, behaviors, and interactions. Thus, institutions structure. And they structure two kinds of behavior, those in relation to resources, what can be used, how, at what times, at what frequency, for what goals. But they also structure behavior in relation to and in response to the behavior of other agents who are, and, and, and through that, the, uh, by, by defining the dynamics of the system. By structuring behavior and helping assess what kinds of behaviors are predictable, institutions provide stability to system interactions, to processes, and to dynamics. They help by providing predictability to the way social systems influence and affect natural systems. But institutions also play a very important second role when it comes to the behavior of social and ecological systems or coupled natural human systems. And that is to structure information acquisition and processing. They're the means through which it is determined in these models what information will be created, which, which part of this information will become available to agents, what information agents will use, will receive about resources uh, and about the natural components of the system and how they will act. Information about the outcomes of past actions and the information that will then be used to make new decisions and new choices about how to behave. In addition, to the extent a given representation models it, institutions also structure how received information is processed by, a, by an agent. The same information received by different agents will undergo different kinds of cognitive processing depending on the norms and rules that have been internalized by an agent or that act as an external constraint on the agent. So one can say institutions provide stability to coupled systems and they do so by precipitating our expectations, our projections about what other agents will do, what other agents expect, how other agents will act, and what the, even inferring what the intentions of other agents are when they undertake an action. But paradoxically, institutions are also responsible for change, for predicting change in coupled natural human systems. When decisions and behaviors do not conform to institutions, the system is unstable and out of equilib equilibrium. Institutions can generate change in two ways. One, self-organized change, and two, externally inflicted change. To understand the first, it's useful to think about how institutions are imagined in most social science research. On the one hand, they influence what humans do or think or attempt or intend. But on the other hand, institutions are also human artifacts. They are created by people through both conscious and unconscious choices sometimes as the unintended results of changes in behavior and the resulting behavioral patterns and irregularities. Changes in behavior in couple systems representations come about either through impact of changes in the natural system or through human perceptions of what is happening in the social or the coupled system. Thus, for example, in a grazing system, new beliefs about how existing grazing frequency affects rangelands or affects grasslands can lead to institutional change. And changes in the productivity of grassland from the information about the natural system can lead agents in the coupled system to select new operational rules to manage or to use to uh, to use the uh, use the rangeland. External so th these are examples of internal uh, internally uh, inspired changes that occur in coupled systems. External impetus to institutional changes also can take many different familiar forms through demographic shift, through in-migration, through technological changes, through market prices, all the things that Marx talks about. Thus, we suggest institutions change when incentives change. Institutions change when calculations of costs and benefits change. They change when resources become scarce. They change when resources become abundant. They change when new information becomes available. They change when new resource substitutes become available. But the point is not that they change. 
The point is that these developments, internal or external, don't always lead to change, and they don't always lead to stability. But an actionable theory of institutional change is necessary to know when institutions will change, not that institutional institutions will change or they will remain stable. We have insights about possibilities. We have insights and possibilities and insights about possibilities. In general, we ascribe too much possibility to institutions and institutional change, but on the basis of insufficient knowledge about causality. This is not a problem for a descriptive science. Great, <coughs> excuse me. More acute fide fidelity to social and ecological phenomena are a part of the goal of descriptive sciences. But it's a problem for a field that seeks not just to be a descriptive, but also an analytic, an explanatory, and a predictive science. Institutions as solutions uh, is, is a critical part of how a uh, couple systems imagine institutions. That because by serving socially desirable ends, they will lead to more positive, less negative outcomes. Institutions are sticky. They are selected for addressing specific problems. They have inertia, and institutional change is both ill-understood and under-analyzed. And yet, when it comes to improving outcomes, prescriptions for changing policies and institutions are almost available. How should we deal with, or how should we address any given ecological, environmental, or social problem? And the response is almost always in terms of change policies, change institutions. How do we create a solution to climate change, increase taxes, create new quotas, or create new caps on how much emissions are possible? How do we deal with uh, uh, CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons, create a new international agreement. So these are all recommendations about using institutions as a solution to solve problems. Institutions are selected for addressing specific problems. They have inertia, which is why they create stability, but they also create change. And our understanding of both institutional change and institutional stability is under, uh, is both under analyzed and underdeveloped. And yet when it comes to improving outcomes, prescriptions for changing policies and institutions are inevitable. We, we, even as we don't know and we don't, we cannot well predict what exactly are the changes that policy changes would accomplish or whether a particular policy change would lead to a given outcome in which you are interested. When it comes to solving problems, we say bring about a change in institutions. The lack of a theory of institutional change is particularly a problem for CNH systems research because of the role that institutions and governance play as solutions. We see institutions as solutions to concerns about undesirable versus desirable, undesire, undesired or undesirable interactions, as solutions to concerns about feedbacks, and as a way of addressing undesired outcomes. Too much water is being used, increase the price of water. Too many wild animals are being harvested, increased patrols for monitoring and apprehending poachers. People are unaware of increases in average temperatures, educate them to adopt heat resistant crop varieties. These solutions ultimately all require changes, changes in institutions and for such changes to be sticky. However, if we don't know why and when institutional change is sticky or yields more sticky outcomes, and how to make suggested changes more sticky versus more ephemeral, our, our calls for creating new institutions in the role, call into question the role of CNH analyses in regulating coupled interactions or in supporting the stability of coupled systems. In conclusion, some of the questions I have posed in this short talk about institutions in coupled systems research are relatively easy to flesh out and elaborate. How are institutions represented and incorporated in research on coupled systems, or what role do institutions serve in such research, or what is the effect of different ways of conceptualizing institutions in modeling process interactions, process outcomes. But other questions, somewhat implicit, require a lot more intellectual work and investment. When are institutions more versus less sticky? When are institutional changes more versus less likely to unfold as a result of feedback and interactions within coupled systems representations? And when are unfolding institutional changes more likely to find social anchors rather than being rejected? Working towards answers to both these sets of questions, 
when do institutions promote stability and when do they promote change is a necessary, is not just a useful, but a necessary step towards learning from the really important work of different researchers focusing on coupled systems. And that's the end of my talk. And I'd love to invite your thoughts about, or your questions about stability versus change in institutional origins and impacts. Thank you. If you do this, I'll just call you, okay? Because <laughs> I see your hand going up, <laughs> okay? You too. Yes, please. Yeah. Can you introduce yourself? Like, what's your? My name is Cheryl Palms. Um, oh, okay. Cheryl. Yes. And so my question is, and that's why I'm a biogeochemist, so so my question goes to Yeah, so the question is, at what level uh, is the idea of institutions being invoked in this presentation? Is it at the level of community or state or NGOs? And I think what I'd say is that I'm imagining institutions less in their organizational form and more in the kind of rules or what is the purpose of a given set of rules in the functioning of a system. So whether it is an NGO or a government, uh, central or federal government, or a local community, they can all embody these three different kinds of rules that I talked about. One, institutional rules that are operational and that enable everyday interactions and relationships to be guided. The second, management. So what happens when these existing institutional rules for structuring interactions are violated or there are different ways in which they are brought into stress. How do you resolve those issues? Or how do you implement existing operational rules so that everybody follows them? And third, how do you make choices about these management rules, so to speak? You, you, so essentially, the way the Austrians describe them are operational rules, management rules, and constitutional rules. So that's the sense in which I'm thinking about institutions in the context of coupled systems rather than the organizational forms they take, which can be, as you rightly point out, community or the state or market institutions or NGOs or international donors, et cetera. Yeah. Thank you, but has there been any analysis to date? Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, that. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. About the stability or ability to change? Yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. So my sense of the field is that uh, there are a lot of analyses of institutional change and of stickiness. Uh, very few of them uh, provide a sense of the different drivers of stickiness and change. Uh, so you know, a fully elaborated theory of institutional change would, would outline and describe a set of conditions which in different contexts either promote or undermine the prospects for stability. And I think that's what is missing from the field. And so we have, you know, we clearly have uh, many examples and we clearly can think of many examples, each of us, of when institutions change. So, if, you know, what I was trying to say is that when relative prices change, there's a pressure on institutional change. When you have the emergence of new technologies, there are institutional changes. When higher level policy changes happen, so constitutional rules change, which can happen through legislators, then there might be changes also in lower level institutions. Or when people's expectations converge around a new set of social roles, institutions might change as well. But this is highly, how should I say, both overdetermined and underdetermined, in the sense that not always do you get institutional change when these things happen, and very often you get institutional change even when none of these things happen. And so what we need is a way of thinking about institutions that is somewhat more capable of explaining observed institutional change in a, in a systematic way, and which is 
allows us to make better predictions about when institutional change should be expected much more than not. Yeah. Yeah. Less. The hard questions Jane will answer. <laughs> you want this? Yes, you. Oh, yeah, um, thank you. So um, I'm trying to uh, sort of suss out the policy implications of the insights that you've given us on institutions. So this week in, I guess, Nairobi, UN Environment is trying to come up with some governance policy with regards to um, geoengineering in the face of climate change, both carbon dioxide removal technologies and solar radiation management and other sorts of technologies. So if you were to be advising UN Environment on their week of trying to figure this out and come up with governance approaches, which is to say institutions, mm -hmm. um, what sort of advice would you give them? Burn it all down. <laughs> no, uh, sorry, just kidding. Uh, I was trying to channel AOC, but I'll stop. Um, I don't know, Les. I mean, this is this is really. <sighs> I have a friend who says that the the great virtue of our jobs is that we are completely irrelevant. That if I if you don't come back to work tomorrow, nobody will die, and I think that is true. I, you know, some people might die in the long run because I won't make any money, but mostly, she's right that we, nobody will die if I don't have any policy advice, if I don't do any more work starting now. Uh, so, so your question is very interesting because it both kind of forces me to talk about the practical implications of what I'm saying when what I tried to do was to really remain very focused and situated within uh, uh, intellectual formation. Uh, and, and it, you know, you're pulling me out of my comfort zone because I don't think I have that much to say for policy. But to give, to give the respect that your question deserves, I, what, what, what advice would I, you know, I might just say some very tired old things, like involve local people in the decisions you're making, because otherwise you're just trying to achieve a global public good without paying attention to what local population's needs are. And most of the, and this is something that a lot of people have said, that most of our uh, emissions can be laid at the doors of maybe 70 companies since the beginning of time, which is say the industrial revolution. And we all see ourselves as being responsible and we certainly are, but to imagine large scale change to happen on this topic, uh, our individual behavioral changes will will matter, but what will matter much more is the extent to which we can imagine a different world, that the kinds of small changes that Al Gore talks about in his movie, the in or documentary, The Inconvenient Truth, and the, or that, that most newspapers are fond of telling us we should accomplish in our lifestyles, eat less meat and fly less and so forth, are going to make only, small, only a small difference. So without significant shifts at the level of the collectivity, I would say the individual exhortation, exhortations to individuals for changing the lifestyles are not going to be very effective. And so I don't know that, that anybody would be either interested in listening to these things or even if these things are correct. But that's probably what I think. And that's not so much based on the work that I'm doing, but just like stuff I read, I guess. I know you have a follow-up comment <laughs> or question. <laughs> no? OK. I think it gets recorded if you, okay. is that right? Uh, that one's for the room, but it, it helps you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I was just thinking about uh, institutions like, uh, they have certain expectations, but a lot of times those expectations aren't met. You, you have unexpected outcomes when you, when you have institutions. And I was thinking a little bit beyond that, uh, thinking of the SDGs. And you know, we've been working on the SDGs recently. You have all these implicit trade-offs among the different um, SDGs, which sustainable development goals, which could be looked at as some sort of international institution uh, for you know, improving sustainability of the planet and so forth. 
And I was just wondering your thoughts on, on this idea of, of trade-offs uh, among uh, institutions and how you view that, particularly in the, in the case of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And you know, when we talk about unexpected outcomes, I think Les's uh, example would be a good one. I don't think we really know if we start uh, reflecting solar radiation out of the atmosphere, we may have unexpected outcomes. We, you know, it just might happen. So, you know. Yeah, on the on the on this idea of how to regulate geoengineering or how to enable it to happen, I, I, you know, every time I hear the word geoengineering, I remember something I read about it, which was, I think, who was Obama's uh, science advisor, PCAST advice, science advisor? Uh, does anybody remember? Uh, energy, Holdren. Yes, so I heard. I remember something that Holdren once said. It's like. Uh, you are in a boat and it's rocking violently because of a storm and you tell as the captain of the boat to all the passengers, you know, just move in time with the oscillation of the boat because of the storm in the opposite direction and then you'll stabilize the boat. I don't know if, you know, if it's an apocryphal story or if this was actually said by him, but that's what geoengineering solutions to climate sound like to me. That, and exactly because of the things that you just said, which is that we don't know how the unintended outcomes will unfold. We are trying to address one problem by undertaking really a step change in what we are doing. And it's not clear that that will actually solve the ill effects of what we have done in the past. I think on the SDGs, I, I feel like there is, you're right, that they are a kind of institution and in that they both structure our expectations and they uh, prompt behavioral change from a lot of different organizations. I feel like the major, uh, not the major, but one significant concern regarding the SDGs is that they, you know, there are 17 of them and there are, what, 169 targets and unclear how many indicators, I think around 150 indicators or so, that they, that the way they are stated, uh, they all appear to be equally important. I mean, I, we, we probably, all of us can probably say that some SDGs are more important than others, but, you know, whether it is, but there's probably some disagreement about whether it is zero hunger or eliminate poverty by 2030 or terrestrial life or marine biodiversity, marine, mar marine forms of life. Like, which of these is more important is, not very clear by just looking at them. And for the most part, the UN system has left any imagination of which of these is more important to the individual countries and agencies that decide, okay, we are going to focus on one or the other of these. And that has, I think, two kinds of problems. One, it, it enables action to occur, but without sufficient reflection on when these different actions in the service of these different SDGs are going to be convergent, going to lead to convergent versus divergent, or uh, outcomes which support each other or which undermine each other. So I can easily imagine action on climate change, many people arguing, will lead to uh, tensions in reaching the goal of achieving zero hunger. Or I can imagine the idea of uh, or greater energy security affecting what happens to climate. So I think there are a lot of different ways in which the, the lack of specification of which of these is the most, are the most important SDGs prevents meaningful synergies from being achieved for these different SDGs and in the achievement of these different SDGs. Uh, but some, because, and the other issue is that some of, action on some of these is clearly convergent and is synergistic, and by not talking about which of these are more important, we don't, we also fail to exploit the potential synergies in the achievement of the different SDGs. So trying to reduce inequality may very well also have positive impacts on uh, reduction in, on reduced emissions. But we, we can't really, uh, without much more research on how these different institutions connect to each other and support each other or are in tension with each other, we fail to achieve both the 
potential synergies and we are not as mindful of the potential tensions among the different SDGs. So, you know, so, so in that sense, it seems almost like we can focus on things that are less important while the house is burning down. And that's kind of the f way I feel about <laughs> the world we are in right now, even as we know that on a lot of different indicators of social well-being, we have had tremendous improvements in the last 50 years but they have also come at a remarkable cost and a remarkable threat to our longer uh, longer term survival and well-being on this planet not just ours in particular well ours yes but also in particular of countless species and countless ecosystems Catherine. thanks you've given us a lot to think about so i don't offer a question as much as a couple of reflections and uh, just a bit ago, you said, you know, we really need to imagine a different world. And, and so as we talk about institutional change, it seems to me that in this past discussion of SDGs reinforces it, that really we aren't interested in why institutions change or whether they're sticky or not, but how can we try to encourage institutions that actually work toward creating a more sustainable world, one in which we and all of the resources that we're interdependent with uh, need. And, hmm. and so I wonder if the question is, how can we encourage institutions that do this, and how can we encourage institutions that don't to change? Mm -hmm. And I. I feel like that might be blowing it up really big, but I kind of feel that's really where we want to go. Yeah, I don't disagree with you at all. <laughs> so, yeah. In, in, in many ways, trying to think about which kind of institutions we want to uh, uh, support for bringing about more positive change. Uh, and which ones we we want to we want not to support or we want to undermine is not that different from talking about which when is it that institutions are stable i mean it's imp it's imposing a normative filter on the question of when do institutions change and when do they not or when do they when are they stable because ideally some institu hopefully some institutions that even exist today are leading to or supporting more positive outcomes and we would want them to be more stable versus others that are not and we want those to change yeah yeah yes so for me it's just a more of a clarification question i think in your in your talk you mentioned at uh, early on in your in your talk about overestimation of the stability uh, that then uh, uh, of the influence of uh, institution, but you also mentioned flexibility. But I think that the majority of your talk focus on the stability bit. I just want you to uh, elaborate, if you can, on the what do you mean by the o uh, overestimation of flexibility? I, maybe you did, but I, I may have yeah. uh, missed it. Yeah. Oh, thanks. I think uh, you may be right, and you know when you write a talk, you don't always. Uh, hear the effect of the talk. You only hear it after doing the talk. So thanks for that comment. Uh, I think the, the idea is very straightforward in that we, when we are talking about institutions, because we think of them as, because we think of existing institutions as structuring and as stabilizing behavior and intentions and expectations and interactions, we see them as providing stability to what exists. Right? But at the same time, we think of institutions as not springing de novo, right? The institutions that exist today are the result of a long process of human beings working to create new institutions, right? So the US Constitution was created by human beings. So once created, it led, it has led to tremendous stability in what you can expect and what kinds of behaviors are permitted and so on and so forth. But there have also been amendments to the US Constitution and these amendments are again the result of purposive human actions. So 
all of the discussion or that, that I invoked essentially not really talked about in any depth about how we think of institutions as solutions to problems that we face, whether in the social or in the social ecological domain, are founded in our belief about the malleability and flexibility of institutions. We think that we can create new institutions to solve this problem. But at the same time, we also believe that institutions <laughs> stabilize structure, uh, and structure expectations. So you know, we do both these things at the same time in our models of coupled human action, coupled human and natural, uh, couple natural human systems. We think of institutions as enabling stability, as imparting stability to the system, but when the system leads to socially undesirable or undesired outcomes, we say let's create new institutions without thinking about or without having a clear sense of how to move from the existing institutions that impart stability to the new ones that we want to solve problems. So that's what I, that's what I meant when I talked about the simultaneously think of institutions as overestimate the ability of institutions to remain stable or to create stability because you know we are changing all the time and we give them tremendous flexibility because we at the same time think institutions are structuring things that happen. As far as the theory goes, would, would, would it be an oversimplification that uh, if the economy can be solved by looking at it in terms of a different time scale that institutions can in one way uh, try to provide stability in a short time scale, but also try to reduce flexibility in a longer time scale. I don't know if that's an oversimplification or in the, or what do you think? I don't, I mean, so the, I think it is tempting to think that way, but I don't think incorporating time explicitly in our estimation of institutional change will solve the problem because sometimes institutional change happens like this, and sometimes thousands or hundreds of years pass and nothing changes. So for example, in our interactions, we have a very long standing institution that when one person talks, the other listens. And when that institutional condition is not met, then there is no meaningful exchange of ideas. And so that institution has stood the test of time for thousands of years, right? For, and we can argue about why and what, for what reasons, right? But at the same time, we know that a lot of institutions around, for example, gender equality or around uh, change in, uh, change in uh, economic outcomes, those change very quickly. And so the question is not so much about time. I think it is important to keep in mind the time period over which something, some institutions change. But I think the drivers of institutional change come from different sources, not from the passage of time on its own. Yeah. Yes. Hi, I'm Pedro Sanchez from Soils and and water sciences. Um, I, I think this, this point that you have made of institutions being a collection of rules and norms is extremely important and illuminating, and I, I thank you for that. It's not my point, so I, I would <laughs> love to, well, I I would love to be recognized for having made that point, but really, if I am to be even like 5% honest, I can't say it is my point. <laughs> The point you mentioned. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to, happy to take the credit for mentioning it. But yes. I, want to, I want to ask you a provocative question. Uh, there's an institution right now that we all know that is under severe stress. Uh, and I, I mean the federal government of the United States. Um, what, what can your theory <clears throat> help us in either understanding better what's going on or in providing some Solutions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, if I had the answer to this, I would bottle it and sell it for five bucks a pop to every person in, in this country. I really, uh, uh, Pedro, I don't have the answer to that. I will say one thing, that what we are seeing right now is the result of institutional stability. That is to say, we have ascribed certain roles and certain capacities to the office of the president and to different institutions in this country. And we are seeing the effects of that being reflected in terms of what happens when the roles that we think should inhabit those offices are not the ones that are met. Uh, but I'm also convinced, 
you know, I mean, really, you're asking more of a political question than a question about institutions. Uh, so if I were to put on my optimistic political science hat, I would say that we should see the reaction to this tremendous assault on the U on U.S. institutions, both at the federal but at uh, a whole variety of levels. We should see the reaction to this assault emerge by the next electoral uh, in the next electoral cycle. And I think what will then happen is that we will change some existing constitutional or uh, uh, management level rules about how and what kind of expectations need to be met by the office of the president or by our uh, electoral systems. So I, I'm afraid I don't know anything from what I said. I don't know, I can't think of a corollary or a, an inference that would help answer this question. But it's a question that in the back, is in the back of, I think, really any thinking person in this country. And, and then, unfortunately, we need more thinking people in this country. So, yes. Hi, my name is, ooh, that's loud. My name is Katie McNamara. I'm a PhD student in public health. And I was thinking about how, how can we think about when maybe really large policy changes happen that make us all think, oh wow, this is massive change and things are getting better. But then there's almost these skeleton policies that straddle and that maintain institutional norms. I think about the getting rid of Jim Crow in the South. That Jim Crow is gone, but institutionalized racism still remains because of all of these smaller policies. How can we kind of sweep these smaller policies towards the same direction to make them maybe never a complete change, but more realistically in the direction that this larger change is showing us? Yeah. So, Katie, I don't know that, again, I don't know that I have an answer to your question, but I will make a distinction. I will, I will draw, not a distinction. Uh, I do question, I, I guess I question the distinction between the idea that there are uh, large scale changes that happen certainly, and then a lot of very, very small changes that have to happen over a period of time. I think very often, and this is also goes back to your question, sorry, I don't remember your name, uh, you know, how fast do institutions change? I think people are active in changing institutions that they don't like uh, almost constantly. But the effects of these constant efforts to change institutions become more apparent or become apparent at different time scales. So it is not that suddenly institutional change happens and we go, wow, I think you're right that that's, that's how it appears. But I think the groundwork for that sudden institutional change was laid over the actions, or laid through the actions of and over the course of a very large number of discrete events and people's work. Uh, but it appears to us that when the, when the tide breaks or when the change actually happens, that it happened very suddenly. But that sudden change would not have happened without the constant work of countless thousands, perhaps millions of people and countless thousands, millions of actions. So how do we make that happen in our lifetimes or in our uh, own uh, in our own experience of the way the world works. I think one key part of that answer is, is, to, is to remain humble in what we can accomplish, but to also try carefully to bring about the kind of change we want to see in the world and have the confidence or have the faith even, uh, although I hesitate using that word, uh, have the faith that that change will come about and it will come about because of the result of our actions even if we don't see it in our own lifetimes. Because if we don't, then we can be sure that change will not come about. Uh, yeah, it doesn't happen on its own. And just like, you know, to give a very mundane aspect of that, 
if you want to publish in a top journal, you have to submit a paper to that journal. If you don't submit a paper, then you definitely will not publish in that journal. So, and very often, or most of the time, as it happens with me, your paper will get paper will get rejected. Nonetheless, you have to submit it to that journal if you want to get published there. Yes. subjects, disciplines, and to what extent do you, draw, do you draw from political science with the other subjects? So what are the disciplines that you draw from and what fraction uh, in the study of institutions um, in relation to a couple of human natural systems? Yes. Um, and you, know, you mentioned boundary objects. I was just wondering what, what are the boundary objects uh, in the realm of knowledge systems in your research? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. When you first said subject, and then discipline, I thought you were going to ask me a question about Foucault. <laughs> and I was like, wait a second. Uh, I don't know. I, you know I, I, was trained as a I have been trained as a political scientist. And I still think of myself and the way I think as being the way a political scientist thinks. And most of what I said about institutions, uh, at least in terms of the different forms they take or the definition of institutions as being entities that structure expectations, intentions, behaviors, etc. Uh, that's very political science and economics or uh, institutional economics. Uh, I, I do, so in one way in which I guess I am different from a lot of, from the kind of work a lot of political scientists in my field do is to also be willing to think about how other fields think about the same kinds of questions I'm asking, but or with concepts that uh, are not, think about the questions I'm asking using writing in other fields and using concepts that political scientists don't often use or think about. So in that sense, you're right, but the idea of boundary objects, even though some political scientists use it, comes from a field that is not central Centrally political science, or maybe not even political science. Uh, different ways in which people have talked about power is again something that uh, is is not commonly used by scholars in in uh, political economy or comparative politics in political science. So, but I do think that this kind of a borrowing or this kind of an openness to, and of course, it's very self-serving. So I do think that this kind of a borrowing or openness to ideas from other fields or ways of thinking that are more prevalent in other fields is necessary to address the kinds of questions I'm interested in, which are not necessarily political science questions. So, so I would say everybody should be doing that, but that's just me. Hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Marlies. I'm a PhD student in ecology. So we know that there are many factors that will prevent or enable an institution change, institutional changes, and one of those is uh, corruption. So I just want to see how do you see the role of corruption in the process of uh, change of institutions? Uh, thank you. I, hmm, I would think of corruption as something, you know, and I'm going out on a limb here because I don't work either on corruption or corruption's relationship to institutions. I would, I would, I would think of corruption as something that enables existing institutions to persist, maybe. Not so much that push, allows or uh, motivates change. Because that, you know, so it again depends on what level of corruption you're talking about, but corruption essentially enables certain things to occur in spite of institutions that would prohibit the occurrence of that action or of that exchange. So what corruption allows you to do is to sidestep an institution that exists rather than, if you don't like the institution, pressing for its change. Yeah? So I would probably say something that doesn't quite follow from your argument. So tell me more about why you think corruption might enable 
institutional change. Ah, okay. So yes. I, I yes. Yes. So I would so a priori I would say corruption prevents institutional change from happening because it allows those who have the means or the resources to sidestep existing institutions instead of working towards changing that institution so as to create the kinds of outcomes they want. So whether it is about transparency, whether it is about uh, institutions functioning in the way they should, uh, corruption prevents, I think, institutional change. Yeah. So here and then you. you. Hello everyone, my name is Osvaldo Medina, I'm from the Anthropology Department and also with the Water Institute at the University of Florida. Just like a follow up uh, question that Leah just made in regards to the interdisciplinary work that you do. Actually, we are part of a team that we are working in an interdisciplinary project uh, to study a watershed in Costa Rica. So, definitely, like, more like a question from your experience. Um, it's because your work is, is basically like mostly of your work is based on interdisciplinary uh, work. Okay. Um, so I know there is not like a magic recipe like to success in this type of work, but um, I wanted to have some insights of you or from your experience what can be like um, good practices to actually uh, achieve this interdisciplinary yes. work within different fields. Yes. So you can never generalize from any individual experience, but you asked me for my experience, so I'll talk about that, okay? Uh, and there are probably three things I would say. One is that at the point I, uh, so my journey into interdisciplinary work didn't come about by my first becoming a political scientist and then starting to do interdisciplinary work. Even when I came to graduate school, I really was interested in the commons. And contributions to work on the commons have come from economics, from political science, from sociology, rural sociology, anthropology, from history. So very wide range of disciplines. So if you read about the commons, you essentially have to contend with the fact that very often what is being written doesn't speak to each other. Like people are writing about the same thing, but they don't necessarily talk to each other. So in that sense, the work that Eleanor Ostrom did, or the work that you know, the International Association for the Study of Commons did, was to create a conversation which gave some greater respectability to interdisciplinary engagements in studying common property. So, you know, there's a big. So even as I uh, came to it from uh, from an interest in the problem rather than a particular disciplinary orientation. The groundwork for more interdisciplinary work was being laid as I was getting my PhD. Yeah, so there's a big shift in the context, and I th there's a second big shift in the context which is happening and which I think is essential. So you know, you think of a discipline. What defines a discipline? And I think there are three things that define a discipline, and this is very obvious stuff. It's a set of theories, a set of methods, and a kind of in a set of data or different ways of thinking about data. And I think every discipline has its own definition of what are the relevant theories, what are the appropriate methods if you, you know, and it depends on the time as well. So progressions and game theory were very prevalent for political science when I was a student and different kinds of uh, mathematical models or econometrics are very central to economics and and I could, ethnography is very central. So, you know, there, there's a certain set of things that are core for a discipline. And often interdisciplinary work is dismissed by virtue of not having that core. But that's mostly a function of that interdisciplinary formation not having come into existence at a given point in time. So you can imagine something like sustainability science, which, which is highly interdisciplinary, or political ecology, which is highly interdisciplinary, coming into being as more fully formed disciplines by virtue of having created methods or having focused on certain methods and data and theories that they see as integral to political ecological work, to sustainability science work. 
you know, and that often is not just about what happens in the domain of knowledge, it also is about what happens in the domain of organizing of that knowledge. So, you know, often when we interview people in my school, School of School for Environment and Sustainability, a lot of the older faculty will ask the candidate, yes, yes, you're doing interdisciplinary work, but what's your training in? Like, what is your training? And then, if you go to a business school, you know, most often they hire people who have been trained in other business schools. So they don't ask what's your training because it's perfectly reasonable to say that I've been trained in strategy or in production and operations management or in marketing or in human, it's not, reason, not necessary to say I got a sociology degree or I got an economics degree. Yes, that is often the case, but you can also equally say I'm trained in finance, which is not in economics, like in, you know, it's a management field. So I think that organizational change hasn't yet happened in the case of sustainability, even though the interdisciplinary knowledge formation is emerging. And I think it is necessary for, for, us, to, for us to gain, for us, us, for us to gain credibility as interdisciplinary scholars, if we want to. We need to make both the organizational and the uh, epistemological shift occur and happen together before interdisciplinary work is questioned in the way that some of my colleagues do, which is, what's your training in? What's your real training in? Like, I'm, you work on institutions, but are you an economist or a political scientist or a, you know? And my answer would be, that's really not a reasonable question because you are undermining what we need to see happen for us to solve some of the most important problems in the world whether it is climate, ecosystems, biodiversity, inequality, polarization, because existing disciplines come at it from very partial perspectives and we can't address these problems from the kind of partial perspectives that disciplines bring to it. So that's a bigger answer than you were asking for, but that's, that's what I would say, because I, th I not only do I think that I do interdisciplinary work. I think everybody needs to do interdisciplinary work if they care about what's happening in the world. If they don't care about it, then yes, they should just keep doing what they're doing. Whatever it is. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Lorian, and uh, I'm an art economist. I'm doing my PhD dissertation on forest governance in uh, West Africa. And you already kind of laid the foundation of what I was going to ask by talking about the common pool resource. So I'm intending to use the common pool resource uh, experiment. And I was wondering, it's more like a validation question to you. Do you think that those experiments kind of um, touch the stability and the flexibility point that you were mentioning? Because it just happened, it's more like static and you don't get to follow up. So. What is your, what do you think? Like, uh, is it good enough to already get to talk about that stability that you have in institution? So that was my question. Yeah, so which institutions do you have in mind? Like when you say, do you think these institutions already have the stability or flexibility? Which institution are you talking about? Uh, like uh, informal, mostly. Like yeah. just informal, yeah. because yeah. Uh, I will be looking at the two aspects, yes. formal and informal. But I was wondering if the game, experiment game in field, can kind of already create that environment where I can really point out those stability and places. Yeah, yeah, mentioned. yeah. Sure. I, you know, I don't. Uh, I'm not sure. I know the game theory field well enough to answer your question uh, very sort of with a lot of confidence. But my sense is that there is a lot of work in game theory or in representations of institutions in game theory that talks about when you get an equilibrium or when you get behavior that conforms to a game equilibrium and when you don't. And I would say for the kinds of behaviors that conform to an equilibrium, you should expect to see stability in those institutions. And when you have institutions that are represented through games in which equilibria are very uncommon, you should expect those institutions to change. Right. So I think there is, there is a lot of connection between the work that different common property theorists have done and connecting what happens in different commons situations 
to the representations of these models of uh, uh, institutions to at least have some initial insight into whether institutional change is what is likely to happen or not. And I think the informal rules are much more capable of uh, conforming to this faster because they don't necessarily have to negotiate multiple levels of institutional uh, uh, support. Right. So uh, I'm James Martin, I'm a medical geographer. Um, so you described uh, institutions as uh, being, uh, that institutions could be uh, sets of expectations or behaviors. So I was wondering if institutions are necessarily uh, unique to human systems, and if they're not, do you think that institutions that could occur outside of human systems, um, could those institutions be overlooked in <laughs> That's a great question. I totally don't, I definitely do not think institutions are unique to humans. So I think a lot of primate species and even other mammalian species possess institutions and there are different degrees to which the institution related behavior is internalized or is a result of sanctions that the group enforces. So the sanctions or the uh, enforcement of institutions, so that's the second order management set of rules, are less common. I think operational rules are more common among non-human species. Uh, to what extent do we look at them or do we pay attention to them in trying to create or trying to think about our own institutions? I think for the most part very little. Right? I mean when you read about thousands of elephants getting poached every year or thousands of rhino horns being confiscated at international borders, it's clear evidence that we don't really care about other institutions or other species institutions. We don't even care about whether they continue to exist or not. Uh, the, and that sort of brings us to a different point about institutional institutions and institutional change, which is that institutional change is typically led and enforced by those with the capacity to bring about change because the new institutional form is what they expect to benefit them more. So institutions don't come about, institutional change doesn't come about just because the new institution is going to be socially beneficial. It comes about because some consequential group has the power to change the institution in a direction that will benefit that group rather than society as a whole. Uh, just a reminder that the room will also be talking tomorrow in the Rights Union Chamber, which I will be looking up on the map as I leave. <laughs> 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 um, and I will email out uh, one of the distributions we have with a room number. And so it's on at least the floor. Uh, and tomorrow you're talking on. Tomorrow, tomorrow I'm talking about. Uh, I'm, so the case of your right from the Himalayas, it's a case, it's a study of a sustainable development program which sought to, lead, sought to create positive environmental attitudes, behaviors, and outcomes by providing benefits to those who were, whose behavior it tried to change, whose attitudes it tried to change. And the research examines the perverse outcomes of these efforts by the program and why they happened. So instead of, instead of getting environmentally positive attitudes, behaviors, and outcomes, we got the opposite, and the question is why. And that's what the research will talk about. And apparently that's the grand talk. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>